This is the PR Podcast, a show about how public relations helps you tell your story to the world. We talk with great PR practitioners who have the skills, creativity, and just plain savvy to get their clients noticed. Now here's your host, Jody Fisher. Hey, everyone, and welcome to the PR Podcast. I'm Jody Fisher. Thanks for joining us. Well, we have got a terrific guest this week, and he scratches an itch of a a subject that I love talking about. So we're not going to do any of the normal chit-chat up front. We're just going to get right into it. Mark McLennan is the general manager of the Boston office of CNC, a communications agency that helps good causes and purpose-driven brands. He also teaches PR ethics at Boston University and was the 2016 national chair of PRSA. His book, Ethical Voices, Practicing Public Relations with Integrity, was just released by Business Expert Press and has quickly become the number one PR book on Amazon. It includes more than 100 real-world ethics incidents with advice from global industry leaders at companies including Starbucks, Lenovo, the TSA, the Federal Reserve, Harvard Business School, IBM, CDC, and the world's largest public relations agencies. I love talking about this topic. Mark, welcome to the PR Podcast. Thank you for having me, Jody, and I love talking about it as well. Well, people so think, people ahead. think ethics is dry, but ethics is at the center of murder, mayhem, and Machiavellian maneuvering through human history for thousands of years. It is it is incredibly important, and I think in our industry, especially when a lot of people think of us as people who, let's say, like to play fast and loose with the truth, which we don't. At least the good ones don't. Um, Ethics is all of it, right? Why write a book on ethics, Mark? Well, ethics is a passion of mine. It's scratching your itch. It's been scratching at your mind. It's something I've been loving for my entire career. But what I thought about is when I think about ethics and PR people would think about the big ones, Enron, Volkswagen, the major scandals. We have the great codes of ethics from PRSA and the page principles and PRCA. But those tend to be high level and abstract with some very black and white examples. And I thought there was a need for the the common challenges that we may face. You know, everything from talking about when you're asked to impersonate a reporter or leak info into time, leak info on a reporter, you know, lying on your timesheets. What do you do with transparency and national security? These are kind of the key issues that I think people are dealing with. And so I launched my blog and podcast ethicalvoices.com about three years ago have interviewed about 150 people right now and just asked them really three questions what's the biggest ethical challenge you faced what do you see as the best challenge biggest challenges facing the profession and what's your best advice and i gathered all that up you know into a book pushed it out with these case studies to hopefully be a resource for people in their overall daily lives that they can turn to as well as for students that are entering the profession have you found a uh, a singular theme that continues to come up when people start to talk about ethics and sort of practicing ethical behavior? Is there something that keeps coming around to? I mean, people think of it as either lying, maybe, or or just sort of bending the truth, or you know, like I said, playing fast and loose with the truth. Is there a theme that comes back to you when you talk about ethics? I think if you're looking at themes, the biggest one is when I talk to people, eighty percent of them say, "Well, you know." I didn't really have a big ethical issue, but wait a minute. I have this and this and this, you know, they always think about, I wasn't told to, you know, steal information. I wasn't told to lie on a earnings report, but it's the small things that come up. And that's what I've seen people have a lot of times. And I would say when it comes to um, the biggest overall issues, our concerns about misinformation and disinformation, what's going on there, as well as people being asked, you know, what is the truth and when do we disclose? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I feel like ethics is one of those things that um, you need to be taught and taught well, and you need to live and work around people who have a high ethical standard. Um, my ethical standard was defined by one of my terrific mentors, Howard Rubenstein, who never, ever, 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 ever um, either planted misinformation, um, flat out lied, um, or even was just you know disingenuous or, or not forthcoming. Um, that did not abdicate him from um, from representing his clients with a full throat, right? You tell their story, but you tell their on their story honestly and ethically. Uh, and, and I feel like our profession, um, uh, like I said, kind of 
people people think that we don't ascribe to that. Do you find that as well? I think, unfortunately, it's the case. I mean, if you look at look at the shows, look at Flack, look at Wag the Dog, look at all the things that are sensational, sensationalistic elements of it all and not what the average person does. So I think there's the common misperception there that can only be addressed by education and by people speaking up when they see it and say, no, this isn't what we do. You uh, did a lot of research. You talked to a lot of people for this book. Do you have some stories of what you found along the way? Maybe you were you came upon a surprising ethics example, or maybe you had an inspiring ethics ex- example. Give us some give us some flavor of the book. Well, I have both. In, in terms of surprising, there were two that absolutely I never expected to hear. One was I was I was on Twitter, and I saw um, the head of the PR Council of Pakistan tweeted out their new code of ethics. And I'm like, I want to talk to him. That sounds interesting. And so his name is Hassan Zubairi. And we had an interview a few months later. And his biggest ethical issue was what do you do when your client is threatened with death because they're associated with India and a yogi? And that is something I guarantee you 99.9% of PR people in the US have never had a face. But it was a legitimate issue that he had to deal with. And how do you go and handle that and make sure your employers are comfortable because you're putting them at risk as well. So I think there was a, that's a really fascinating example. I've actually had two death threat issues. There's another one where it was a professor, Quentin Langley had one of his students from Saudi Arabia denounced as being an apostate in class. And does he testify or not? Um, But if you want to go for a kind of quirky, surprising Bonnie upright, who's um, a great PR pro out of Florida, intellectual property theft is a big deal. You know, can you use an image you take from Google? What's we're going to be doing in terms of borrowing stuff? Well, she faced intellectual property theft in a completely different way. Her mother's obituary has become one of the most plagiarized obituaries in history. People have stolen it and used it more than 20 different times. And it's her mother's personal words that she wrote. And so she, she, you know, how do you respond to that? You know, we think about IP theft from our corporate issues, but when it's something so personal to your personal life, how to respond to folks taking a lot of your IP and things that your parents and your family wrote and using it for commercial gain. Wow. Okay. So I'm fascinated by that example. We have to, we have to drill down on that a little bit. How do you take a, a, an obituary and reuse it? I mean, I guess you could chop it up, but tell, tell us the story here. You, you know, there's a couple of ways that it was. And I mean, I, a, you can always read it in the book or listen to it on my podcast for if you really want to get in depth, but her mother knew she was dying and she wrote, a loving, personalized tribute, way she described the grand her grandkids, way she thought about living her life and the no regrets and all these other elements. There were some very distinct phrases, you know, distinct like, you know, Mr. Gorbachev turned down this wall or I paid for this darn microphone, whatever you want that'll go through history. And somebody, and she, because of this obituary, um, it went, it went viral the first time it was written. It was on a lot of local TV. It got, I believe, to the Today Show because it was just such a personal obituary. Um, it was a great one. And then what happened is somebody in another state saw it and decided to use some of the terms to write for their own mother. And, you know, I mean, it was one of these weird situations and somebody, and that blew up, and somebody said, oh, my God, look at this great obituary. And it was a wonderful obituary. It just wasn't the obituary written by the family. It was the obituary written by Bonnie's mother. And so it got to be a weird thing. And you've seen people use different elements of it. Bonnie talks about one where the rest of the family is like, this is not our mother who passed away or it's not our grandmother. She was like a crack addict or a meth addict. This has nothing to do with what she makes sense. And so it's, it gets to be really interesting. And so she has, you know, she says she has alerts set up to tweak it when it happens, you know, and, and she's also seen some of the terms and some of the phrases from it being used in cookbooks and other things about words from my mother where people are now profiting on it. And that's where she gets into some issues. So this I was going to not... say that that's a, that's a big line, right? It's one yeah. thing to use it in a, a free application. Let's just put it that way, right? Or you repost it on your social media. You shouldn't do it. Ethically, you shouldn't do it. But a, a big deal, maybe, okay, when, and can you, get, can, you, can you make that person take it down? Who knows? But when you start to make money off of it, that becomes a whole different ball of wax. Yeah, and again, it's, it's so personal. I mean, it's the I'm sure her mother wrote. That's what makes it there. You know, and if you want to go to something else profound, I mean, I think those are kind of the quirky, fun, interesting ones. The one that I think is the most inspiring and intriguing is I'm not sure if you're familiar with Paula Padin at all. 
She is um, a former PR professional for the Veterans Administration, and she is, in my opinion, a paragon of the profession. She was one of the whistleblowers that exposed the corruption at the VA in Arizona, where they were giving, playing with double entry bookkeeping, and they were keep, not giving veterans the service they needed, and they were making it appear like they were doing better than they were. She's the one that really called it out. She is the one that um, faced repercussions from it. She was fired from her job for reasons that were legally correct, but artificially questionable. Basically, she is a disabled veteran and she can't see. And her husband helped her put a USB stick into a computer, which means that a she had a non-VA employee have access to confidential data. There's a lot of things there where you really just work through how she went through it all, how she reconciled her duty to report it up the chain. And when that doesn't work, does she become a whistleblower and go out the chain? And it's really just a fascinating, amazing story and book um, that I think people should really look at as well. Uh, so interesting. Yeah, it's it really becomes um, so varied and so textured and so different. Um, you know, people think of ethics and they think of, well, you know, do I do I take a paperclip from work or something like that? But when it gets to issues like that, where there are um, there are larger issues at stake. Um, well, that, it's, it sounds fascinating. Um, the paperclip one is a big one, too. And when I talk about that example in my class at BU, that's the one that gets the most discussion because people are like, oh, it's only a couple of paper clips, big deal. I'm like, okay, now you have 10,000 employees. How much is that? Or if you can take paper clips, do you take a box of pens? Do you take this? And they start realizing where is the line that you draw there? And it gets to, that, that's one of the ones that I have some of the best debate over in class is that very simple question. Well, and I think that's probably the easiest way to view ethics, right? Is the paper clip, right? Yeah. Or the pen. Um, if you're okay with taking the paperclip, well, then you're okay with just about anything. Absolutely. Uh, to me, to me, to me, um, you know, now your, your office might have a policy of, oh, you need a paperclip, take a paperclip. That's it, you know, or the penny on the penny at the register, right? Take a penny, leave a penny kind of mm -hmm. deal. Fine, great. If we're all on the same page, cool. But uh, yeah, if, 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 when, if, it, if it's easy enough to break the small rule, you're probably going to work your way up to breaking the bigger ones. Absolutely. Um, and, and it gets to be tougher. To, well, I don't mean to interrupt. It also, if you do those small things, it gets to be tougher to stand up later on down the line. I was talking to Mark Catella, who's uh, currently one of the comms people over at Harvard Business School. And he was talking about it was he was young in his career. And there was somebody who was engaging in inappropriate comment and making disparaging remarks about other people um, that were racist, sexist, whatever have. And he didn't say anything at the time. And it got to be a bigger deal. And he was like, well, I didn't say anything there. So this person thought he tacitly approved when he absolutely didn't was horrified. And so the question got to be, how did he then go raise the issue? Do you go raise the issue? Or once you've had it happen and been okay with it, are you then complicit in allowing it to happen further? And so I think that's another interesting discussion Mark and I had. Very interesting. Very interesting. What do you see bringing it back to our industry, to the PR industry? What do you see or what have you found to be some of the most significant ethics challenges um, that we as PR people face? I'd say there's really two of the most significant challenges. One is being quoted by when I ask that question to people, about 80 percent of them answer misinformation. You know, I personally believe we are entering the disinformation age. It is going to be easier to do disinformation and misinformation than ever. And I think people are being too short-sighted about it because they're looking at it in terms of politics. And I've done a lot of financial services and anti-fraud work in my career. And I see this as the industrialization of fraud. Instead of working to influence a local election, imagine if you can use the technology to spread misinformation to depress Google stock price, short sell it, make a billion dollars. I mean, that's the stuff where people can start doing it. If they can get the misinformation spread and be authentic, and then capitalize on it, you're going to see criminals really starting to act on this, which is something a lot of people don't think about and how to prepare. Uh, haven't, how to we already to seen, haven't we already seen that? I mean, instances on Twitter and elsewhere. It's going to be even easier. For, right. And the thing that also scares me is with the rise of deep fakes becoming easier than ever. And you're going to be seeing people that are activists putting CEOs in bad positions you know, and, and you're going to have people having your executives doing things they never did, saying things they never did. But as a society, what this really scares me about is we're going to trust video. The average person will trust what they see less than they have now. 
the reason George Floyd was so powerful was because we could see the horrific images. It was driven home to the people that the words didn't do it justice, but seeing it was there. But as people are going to start faking these images more and more and do things, is that image going to be as powerful? Or are people going to be dismo- dismissing that as, oh, that's just a deep fake, when it's really something horrific that you need to act on? So I think that's a that's a big issue. And then the other big issue is AI. And I think how we can be using AI ethically. I mean, with chat GPT is the big um elephant in the room right now when you're seeing it and there's a lot of debate i know some agency leads that are letting their junior staff use it to write first draft of press releases and i think we need to be concerned not just about how it's going to impact our workforce but what biases does it have and how do we make sure that we're not bringing these unconscious discriminatory and unethical biases into the activities we're using ai for what is the antidote antidote in your mind um, to all of this misinformation, disinformation, um, you know, people using technologies in ethically uh, impermissible, as far as I'm concerned, ways? Well, if I had the true antidote, I'd be selling it for a couple billion dollars and being quite rich and happy. Um, I think there's there's kind of three things to keep in mind when you're looking at it. One, in terms of combating misinformation, it's the fundamentals of PR. It's making sure you have your channels ready. It's making sure you've got your relationships. You're not building them in the crisis. You're building it beforehand. So if you're actually practicing ethical public relations, engaging your stakeholders, you're going to be able to make sure that you can address things when they happen. But beyond that, if you're looking at the higher level, I think there's two things we need to do. One, we need to make ethics part of the hiring process for companies. You know, if you think about all the interviews that are going on, Rarely are ethical questions asked. And there's ways to do that. Make great ethics questions a part of the interview. Give them give a potential employee a scenario like layoffs where they can demonstrate their ethical reasoning. Ask them to give you an example of an action that aligns with your company values that they've done in the past. A, it shows that they've done research into your company and B, do they allow your values? One of my favorite ways to kind of get to this is from Patrice Tanaka, um, who's another great PR pro. And the question she asks people in every interview is, what is your purpose in life? And she says about half the time she gets blank stares. And it's like, oh, my God, I can't believe anybody's asking this. And she moves on. And the other she uses it to look at are people thinking about themselves, their company, their family, society. She can kind of see what their ethical mindset is overall. And then when you get them in the door, the next big issue is training. I mean, we need to make sure you mentioned this. How do you really get people ready. I kind of call it training your ethical mind. And it's not, it's biological. You know, there's an academy management study that came out a while ago that talks about, we are more likely to make a selfish decision when we don't have time to think. Because it's it's nature. I mean, it's what's good for me. And so what companies do right now is they do ethics training once a year. That's like going to the gym once a year, taking your vitamins once a year. It's not going to really do that much. What you need to do is make it a regular part of your team meetings, at least twice a month. You know, have you highlight a situation you've seen or misstep? Ask everyone else, what do they see? What do they think of it? But the discussion for all three of you, and if you're the manager, you should not be speaking first. You need to speak at the end. And I think there's great discussion that you can have around that. And it helps your team understand the importance that you put on ethics. And they help you uncover issues you haven't considered. And it really helps everybody realize they need to start thinking ethics first. Such such a great perspective. Uh, ethics, I know you think is also very important uh, in matters of DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And and we have uh, had a couple of recent guests on to talk about DEI and its importance, uh, and goes far beyond um, just the you know the what the staff looks like or how the staff thinks kind of thing. Um, t- talk to me a little bit about ethics and DEI and, and how they. I think when it comes to ethics and DEI, this is one of the greatest failures of public relations right now. Too many folks are talking the talk and they're not walking the walk. You know, I mean, think about it when, again, in response to George Floyd, Black Lives Matter, everybody started saying that. It took you this long to realize it. I mean, it it kind of scares me there. And same thing with hiring. We need to do it. How long have we been talking about we need to hire a more diverse workforce? Um, You know, I I applaud Tara Neptune back when he was at Verizon and he was doing RFPs. He was using the stick and the carrot to get agencies to be more diverse. If you wanted to bid on their business, you had to have 30% diverse hires. Um, You know, so, I mean, it's moving the needle in that regard. But I think there's a lot of challenges because people 
aren't necessarily truly embracing it. And there's some pain for those that are in established positions. My wife likes to joke, Mark, you are the patriarchy. I mean, because I'm a middle-aged white male and it's it's true. And so I like to see myself as an ally and move things forward in that regard. You know, Mike Paul, though, um, it's, if you haven't talked to him, reputation doctor, he's a great crisis counselor. He has such, and I have these in the book, such powerful perspective on this. You know, when you look at 33... Businesses that are diverse perform 33% better than businesses that aren't. If I can tell you by acting and embracing diversity, you can increase your profits by 33% and you don't, what does that say? You know, and but there's other hidden pitfalls that I think well-meaning people are falling into. You know, I, I tie this back to our agency. Um, when the big call, when the Diversity Action Alliance was out there and they wanted folks to talk about, how's your diversity? you know, and, and post it publicly and share. And we put up the numbers on our website and we're better than most. We can definitely do more. I mean, there's definitely a way to go there. But then we looked at a by position and, and shared in all different areas. And then we heard from some of our employees that were people of color that they didn't like it because it made them feel like they were tokenized, which is no way, shape or form what it was. And so we had a lead balance. Okay, do we keep it out there to show our commitment and help move the needle or to respect our employees' wishes. And our employees come first. So even though I can get ding now about, well, how come you're not sharing your diversity information publicly? Because the employees, a number of our employees that are would feel tokenized if we did. And so I'll take the hit from that. And so those are some of the things you need to look at as well when you're moving things forward. And is that not an issue of ethics as well? And you it is. making that decision? Yeah. Well, I mean, again, and then the get, that gets into the whole, if you want to go into deontology or teleology or wherever, what's the benefit there? But what is the right and ethical thing to do there? And who, who's, where do your duties lie? I mean, that's, the, that's where the crux of all PR ethics issues, I think, come back to, is what duty is the most important? Is it to yourself, your employer, your client, society? And it's when they come into conflict, that's when you start to have the discussions and the challenges. Is there, uh, just to wind up the discussion there, is there, a, is there a spider sense that people can develop about ethics? I mean, is there a question that people can ask themselves or maybe a litmus test that people can keep in the back of their mind when they need to make a decision as to whether or not it is an ethically proper decision to make? Have you found anything like that? I mean, I have. There, there's, a, there's no one silver bullet. I mean, the simple one that I think probably is quoted more by anybody else is the New York Times test. Am I comfortable with my decisions appearing on the front page of the New York Times, the transcripts of our conversations? If I am, then it's okay. If I'm not, you may want to rethink yourself. I mean, that's pretty much the one basic element you can have. Here, the old Fred Garcia, who's another person I interviewed, though, I think really kind of talked about the need to train it. And, you know, he talks about there's going to come a point when you reach that ethical line and you can't predict when it's going to be but you will definitely face that line. And the question that we need to think about is are you looking at it in the rear view mirror or are you looking at it approaching through the windshield? And you wanna make sure you're training your mind and looking and caring about ethics so you can see it in the windshield so you can turn before you cross the line and have to do damage repair. Great analogy and, and a great visual to keep in mind when we're thinking about ethics. Mark, thank you so much for, for being on here today. My we are gonna say... We're going to segue now into the rapid fire question portion of our podcast. Mark, if you've heard us before, you know this is where we steal a page from inside the Actors Studio, and ask our guests a series of rapid fire questions. These are pure fun. <laughs> so with your indulgence, here we go. Rapid fire question number one, Mark McLennan. What is your favorite news source? Drudge Report. Oh, I don't think we've had that one before. That's a good one. All right. Rapid fire question number two. What is your favorite social media platform? LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Uh, any reason why LinkedIn? B2B, great thought leadership, great connections. It's helped me get more clients and jobs from a purely selfish element there. Yeah, it, it is. It is a uh, it's a terrific platform. I think it uh, doesn't get the respect that it's due. But those yeah. of us who know, know. <laughs> and I think I was one of the first 60,000 people on LinkedIn. So I was like an early adopter. There you go. Nice. All right. Rapid fire question number three, Mark, coffee or alcohol? Diet Pepsi. Oh, dig it. All right. Rapid fire question number four. What's your favorite on the run food? Duncan's. 
All right, you got the Duncan. Nice. I'm from Massachusetts. It's got to be Duncan. Donuts. It's got to be Duncan, right? What else is there in Massachusetts? Come on, you can't get anything else. Rapid fire question number five, Mark. What do you want to be after you finish this career? Sitting on a beach somewhere, relaxing and having a good time with my family. Uh, we got a whole... teaching full time. Oh, that sounds good too. We got a whole bunch of people who are going to be on a who have been on this show who are going to be on a beach. <laughs> <laughs> sounds good though sounds good mark this has been a great conversation please let people know how they can find you online they can go to www.ethicalvoices.com and they can always email me at mcclennan at gmail.com and remind us of the title of your book again please ethical voices practicing public relations with integrity and you can find it on amazon Sounds good, Mark. Thank you again. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Please remember to subscribe to the show. Connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at The PR Podcast, and send us a question or a comment. Our intro is by Christopher Appold. You can find him and his fantastic photography on Instagram at Christopher underscore A-P-P-O-L-D-T. Check him out there and hire him for all your photography needs. You can find me online at Jody Fisher on all the socials and on the web at JodyFisherPR.com. We'll see you next time on The PR Podcast. <music>